Your life is like this string. Your life is like this string. And this string is nice, right? This is, say, tell your neighbor, this, that's a nice string. Yeah, it's a nice string. Sometimes we can't find the end of ourselves, right? Okay. But we found it. And, and our life is like this string, right? We, we look like this one string because ourselves on our own, by ourselves, Apart from others, let me see if I can do this. We're weak, right? We can be broken so easily. We're so, we're so weak. And, and, and this string is only capable of looking like this string. I, on its own, it can look just like this, and that's all it can do because it's just one string. But a friend of mine gave me some Japanese silk art, and I want to show you what you can do when you put a lot of strings together is that you can make them look like this. How much more beautiful are the strings when they are woven into each other to create the art, the masterpiece that is in my hand. Because see, on our own, we can't do this. We can't look like this. We could never produce this, but together we are strong, unbreakable, beautiful, and a picture that God had in mind for his church. This morning, the value that I'm speaking to you about in our Culture Carriers series is community is our design. I want you to say that with me. Community is our design. And there's another part to it that says, we thrive. Somebody say thrive. thrive. Look at your neighbor and tell him, I want to thrive. <laughs> All right, now look at your neighbor and be a little more selfless and say, I want you to thrive. <laughs> but when do we thrive and how do we thrive? And in what context do we thrive? And the value says that we thrive in the context of authentic relationship. Authentic relationship. Look, I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I've noticed this thing about life where I, I almost don't want to experience the greater things in life on my own, right? Have you ever noticed that like if, if okay, how many, how many cook for your family? Raise your hand if you cook for your family. All right, now, if someone's hand is lifted, you should just give them a big hug right now because, right, because you are thankful for them, right? But how many, okay, raise your hand if you cook for your family, okay? Okay, now, keep your hand up, keep, keep your hand up, keep your hand up if you cook for your family. All right, now, now, keep your hand up if you also cook that same meal when the family's not there just for yourself. Okay, well, some of you are looking out for your own appetite <laughs> just fine, <laughs> <laughs> just fine. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not trying to say that's bad. I'm just trying to say that the majority of the room put their hands down. That's interesting, right? How, how many you ever had like a meal that you got at a restaurant and it looked so amazing or maybe it was cooked at your house because your spouse is arguably better than all those chefs anyways, like I feel about my wife. And it was so amazing, and it looked so amazing that you took a picture and posted it. How many? Raise your hand if you've ever done that. Have you ever posted a picture of your food? Okay, let's be real. Okay. And what is it about the better experiences in life that we want to share? Right? I remember this one time, this one day, not that long ago, a friend of mine shared this song with me. And the song was called, Let the Guitar Sing. And the artist was A.J. Jen, if you want to check him out, A.J., and the last name is G-H-E-N-T. And when I started playing this song and listening to this song, I was, I remember, never forget where I was. I was sitting, I was sitting, I wasn't sitting. I was laying in my bed. And I had my Beats headphones on so I could feel the music, I could feel the atmosphere of the song, right? And literally, I was, first of all, taken back by the fact that I'd never heard a guitar sound like someone was singing. And I 
listen. And turn it up, turn that up, turn that up, turn it up. Because my soul was connecting with the guitar. And I, I can't explain it other than to say that I felt like that guitar was singing what my soul felt. And I just, let me be honest, can I tell you what I did? I cried. I cried like a little baby. I was just like, oh my God. And my wife was laying next to me and she was asleep. Okay, she was asleep, y'all. And she was sleeping like just out. And I, I couldn't not show her. I was like, bang, 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 bang. She's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, you gotta hear this. Headphones on her head. She's just like, oh my gosh, what is going on? What are you doing? And she was like trying to listen and half asleep, but then she was falling asleep. I was like, babe, are you listening? And, and, and I, I just went on, I just went on to just literally just share this song with as many friends that I could. I was sharing the link with all my, especially my musician friends, especially my guitar playing friends. But even more than that, some of you in this room, you're like, oh yeah, I remember when you sent that to me. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. But the point I'm making is that I couldn't experience it alone. Yesterday, uh, I don't know if any of you caught this yesterday, but yesterday, one of the most beautiful rainbows with a little, slight little faded double rainbow next to it. But the main rainbow was so bright. And I remember I was walking out of my car yesterday with my little daughter, my youngest daughter. She's almost five honor and she is my little rainbow girl like unicorns rainbows and and all things girly and I, I remember I got I got out of the car and I, we're looking at we're looking and she was like it's so bright and the first thing what did I say to her first thing I said to her is go inside and get everybody and bring them out because we just got to the house so she runs in come look at this rainbow and all of my family came out, and we all stood there, and, and then my neighbor walked by with her dog, and we were literally just all standing there looking at the beauty of that moment. But I couldn't experience it alone. Josh was just telling me on the ride in this morning to church, he was like, Dad, I got an idea, because when we're on vacation, I want to shoot these trick shot videos. And he was telling me about it because he loves to watch Dude Perfect. And, and I was like, well, you could also just do the trick shots, bud. You don't have to make it into a video. And he's like, yeah, but if I make it into a video, then I can show people. What is it about the experiences in our life that even the largest tech companies in our world that have developed an ecosystem of interconnection between us and human beings across the planet, uh, across the planet, what is it that causes us to want to share things with others? It's in us. And I remember I, when, when he said that, I was like, but it's interesting you said that because that's actually going to be what I'm preaching on this morning. And I started explaining it to him. And, and his, his question to me was, he goes, because I was explaining how we want to share things with others and we just don't want to experience it alone. And he goes, well, is that bad, Dad? And I was like, no, but that's the way you were made. It's not bad. It's your design. You see, community is our design. But here's the first question we want to look at. Why? Why is this in us? Why is this so prevailing within every human being to be seen and to experience life with others? And the first thing that we want to look at to understand why that's in us so strong is that we want to begin by understanding who we came from. Now, I don't know about you, but anytime I ever met anybody that didn't know their biological parents, at some point in their journey, there is a hunger and desire within them to know them, right? 
There is a hunger and a desire within them to know them. Usually, they want to at least meet them or talk to them or see them because why is that? Why is that there? Because they want to know where they came from. Why do they want to know where they came from? Because maybe if they know where they came from, they can understand and know themselves better, right? And so what we want to understand is that as human beings, if we come from a creator God, then the more that we understand our creator God, the more that we understand ourselves, and so the starting point to understand why that is in us so strong is to understand that our God is a triune God. Our God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And before any of all this existed, before any relationships between man, between any person existed, there was already relationships. I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but let me just break the news. God didn't make you because he was lonely. God didn't make Adam because he's like, man, I really just kind of bored. I need somebody I can talk to. I need somebody that can, I, I can love and that can love me. You know why? Because God already existed in three persons. And in those three persons for all of eternity past, because that means there was no beginning, which our minds can't really comprehend that. But there was no beginning to the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And let me explain to you very simply how that relationship operates. The Father at Jesus' baptism, that's my Son. And I'm so pleased with Him. Speaks out of the heavens. His voice is audibly heard for those that are there. I'm pleased. That's my boy. Right? Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Right? And then the Bible says that the ministry of the Holy Spirit, what is the ministry of the Holy Spirit? Well, to give us tongue, no. Well, to make us give us superpowers, no. Well, to make us feel alive, no. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is to glorify the Son. And so what we have in the Trinity is each member of the Trinity going, no, no, it's about you. 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 And we have this community and relationship where not one is saying, it's about me. But each one is lifting up the other. And this is the nature of our God. And then the Bible says in Genesis that God made man in his own image. In the image of God, you were created. And so, of course, it's in you. And it's not just in you to be like, hey, listen, here's what I'm doing. Here's what I'm about. Here's what I, but it's in you to want to know that about others. It's in you to want to see that in others. It's in you to want to experience that with others. And it's the beauty of God's creation that he's made you for community because he made you in his image. The other way that we understand why you need community is that we understand the biblical narrative that God creates man, Adam and Eve, they're in the garden, there is no sin. Now, here's the real big question for you to think about theologically. Did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? Okay? It's really worth talking about at lunch today. <laughs> Summer Sunday talk. But the, but the truth is, is that there was something really crazy and beautiful that took place in the garden, and that was that Adam walked with God. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine walking with God and just having a conversation? I wonder what they talked about. And they got to just be together. But sin enters into the world, and now sin separates Adam and Eve from God, and God casts them out of the garden. And now all of a sudden we see throughout time that there is this breakdown. And actually, it doesn't even really take that long because the very first descendants of Adam and Eve, actually those two brothers, one of them kills the other brother. And so what does that teach us is that sin doesn't need a lot of time to live within somebody to be ugly. Sin doesn't need a lot of time to actually over generations become really dark. It wasn't always as dark. It wasn't always as actually breaking down the fabric of the, and the DNA of what God created and what he actually had in mind. And that's what sin did throughout time. And God got so tired of it, we read about in Noah, that he actually wipes out the whole creation and, and just is left with Noah and Noah's family. And, and, but then guess what? It continues after that and sin comes back into the world. And even in some of Noah's sons, we see sin living there in his sons. And we see that it just continues because it's within man to sin and man can't stop sinning. And so God finds a man and he's, this man's name's Abraham. 
And God says to Abraham, I, I, I'm, I'm going to actually make you, uh, within you, I'm going to have you be the seed. And I'm going to begin a people. And they will be my people and that seed will begin in you. Right? And, and, and so we see that in, in Abraham, now Abraham becomes the very first that now throughout the genealogy, that, that Abraham will actually... From Abraham to Isaac to Jacob and on and on and on generations will ultimately lead to the savior of the world that will come. And he will actually repair the broken world that exists in the way that it did. But before the Messiah ever came, the people just kept being given over to, to, their, to their enemies. And, and, and it got so bad where actually the Egyptians were actually um, forcefully treating the people of God that began in Abraham as slaves in a place called Egypt. Egypt and it got so bad and for 400 years they were treated this way and God raises up a liberator in Moses and Moses goes in and he rescues them from slavery and he brings them out of their slavery and then all of a sudden he brings them to a mountain and that's where at that mountain the Ten Commandments come and why did the Ten Commandments come some people think that the commandments that the law of God is given to us for salvation but if that was true it doesn't even work in the biblical narrative because God had already saved them because God had already rescued them from their sin, from their slavery. God had already pulled them out of Egypt before they were even given the law. So the law isn't meant to save us, but what was it meant for? It was meant to be given to them because they were his people. And that's what it says in Exodus. God says that you are my people. And now this is what I am giving you as my people. I want you to live this way. And this is how you will live in the best way. This is how you can be healthy and whole and complete and experience the joy of community in the way that I designed it. It's not meant to save you. The law could never do that. It is meant for you to live whole and healthy and one. And God gave it because he had chosen them to be his people. But if you read on in scripture, you will find in this book over and over and over again that those people keep failing God. You will read over and over again that those people keep falling short. They keep messing up. They keep not doing the right thing. And God sends a liberator, which he calls judges. And these judges rescue them because God has mercy on them. And the whole biblical narrative is that God continually sees their inability to follow him and live for him and love him and serve him and follow the, the, the laws that he had laid out for them, that they can't do it. That they need a savior to do it for them. And that's why Jesus came. And Jesus came so that he could be the one who was able to fulfill the law that we weren't able to fulfill. This is the biblical narrative, and it's really about God and his people. It's about the grace and the mercy that God shows his people throughout all the generations. Because he's chosen us as his people. Tell your neighbor right now, tell him, you're his people. You're his people. I want to talk to you next, not just about why do we need community, but the next question I want us to consider is, what does that community look like? What does it look like? And some of us, if we think about church, we have a certain picture that comes into our minds. Something, something comes to, when I say church, what comes to your mind? Now, let me guarantee you, the same thing is not coming to the minds of the people that don't gather in a church when I ask them that question. Because we all have a different perception of what comes to our mind as the church. But what we have to understand is that God has given us a picture through his word of what this community, his people, the church, because the church is not a place, the church is a people. Because we're, we, don't, we don't go to church, we are the church. Come on, say Amen. We don't, we don't go to church. Hey, did you go to church Sunday? Oh, no, I couldn't go to church. See, that's how we talk. And, and I'm just correcting us for a moment just because it's not like it's wrong to say we know what you mean. But the church is not a service. It's not a location. It's not a building. It's not an organization. The church is a people, and you are that people, God's people, God's chosen people. And the Bible shows us what it looks like. The first thing I want to point out is that it looks a lot like a family. Look at Romans 8, 16 to 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. 
And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. We are God's children. Look at Galatians 4, 4 to 6. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption. Say adoption. As sons, and I'm going to just add in there daughters. And because you are sons and daughters of the Most High God, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. And so the Bible shows us that if we belong to Jesus, that we are his children. Can you just think about that for a moment? You are a child of the God that created the universe. You are a child of the God that spoke and planets went into orbit. You are, a God, you are the, 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 the child of a God that spoke and the smallest little microorganism that we can't even see with our physical eyes and need a microscope to see that has all these cells and layers to it and all of it exists in its complexity. You are the child of that father. You are the child of the Father that throughout all generations never relented to pour out his grace and his mercy on his people. You are the child of that Father. Come on, say amen. You are sons and daughters of the Most High God. And not just in this like, oh, Father of the Most High, but in like a real personal way. <laughs> like that word Abba is intimate. That's not a word you would, you would say, you know, oh, yeah, so-and-so's father. You know, you, you wouldn't say, it's, it's like daddy. It's like that. That's, that's the intimacy of that word. And, and, and what, what the Bible is showing us here is that we are sons. We are children. We are daughters of God. Look at Mark 10, 28 to 31. You, you mind breaking down some word for a moment? Is that okay? Come on, can we get into some word? Okay. Mark 10, 28 to 31. I got a lot of scriptures for you this morning, but I'm so full of it. <laughs> That was like an unintentional pastor joke right there. I didn't even mean for that. Peter began to say to him, see, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold. Say a hundredfold. Now in this time, a hundredfold of what? A hundredfold of what? Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands. What is he saying? What, is he, what does he mean? Leaving father, mother, brother, sister. Well, you see, when we align our life with the gospel, when we get ourselves and we say, your Lord, what does Lord mean? Master. Now, all of a sudden, we, we go a new way. And not everybody in our life is going to go that way. And that's what Jesus is talking about. But what he said is, anyone that's willing to go that way, the way that I desire for your life, the way that I desire for you to go. And for those that maybe are left behind because they don't want to go that way. They don't want to live their lives in submission to the gospel. They don't want to live their lives in submission to a master over their lives who is God, deciding what is best and what isn't best for their lives. And, and so if they don't choose that way, Jesus is saying, look, I'm going to give you a hundredfold of what you leave. How, how is that possible? How could I have a hundred moms, a hundred dads, a hundred brothers, a hundred sisters? If I have three brothers, 300, right? How could I get a hundredfold of what I leave behind? Because we join a new family. Because we're part of a bigger family. Because that greater family, look around the room, hundredfold. How many brothers and sisters God desires to give us? Because we are not just brothers and sisters with each other. We are brothers and sisters with Jesus. And that means when the Bible says co-heirs with Christ, that everything that is promised to him as the perfect, righteous, holy son of God is now also promised to you. Wow. Wow. Not only are we our children, not only are we brothers and sisters with each other and with Jesus, but look at this last piece on family. 
Hebrews 3, 3 through 6. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And look at this. And we are his house. Can you say that with me? We are his house. Can you say it again? We are his house. Say it again. We are his. I wish I had the picture up on the screen, but on our wall at the house, we have six short little values that define the way in which our household functions. And we, for my wife and I, we sat down and we said, What do we believe is most important for us to raise our kids in when it comes to the values that we want them to hold? And the reason why that matters in our house is because then when we're dealing with a problem, we're not dealing with that problem directly. We're dealing with the value beneath the problem that was violated. And as parents, sometimes we can get so caught up with behavior modification. So then what we do is we say, oh, no, don't hit. Oh, no, don't take. Oh, no, don't do. Right. And we're dealing with that problem, maybe with timeout, maybe with, you know, a a little slap on the bum or whatever you use as your tool for correction and discipline, which the Bible says is biblical, that we should bring discipline to our children. Because if we don't discipline our children, we don't love them. Right. Right. But sometimes if we're only dealing with the behavior that they're doing, we're not getting to the root of the behavior, which is beneath it. And so what we do in our home is that we don't talk about the fact that, oh, you can't hit. We talk about the fact that one one of our values is to choose love. And you violated that value when you treated your, your brother that way. One of our values is to show respect. And the way that you just spoke to your mother, that I'm not having that. You cannot speak to your mother that way. You will respect her. And that was not respecting her. You broke the values of this home. Now, if we are, according to the Bible and scripture, Hebrews 3, 3 through 6, the household of God, if I, as an earthly father, have values for my home that I am convicted to defend, can I just ask, just just let me pose the question, how much more of a conviction was it, is in the heart of God to defend the values of his house? How much more? I cannot even fathom how much more. How, I wonder if we know what those values are because we're part of God's household. And when we're part of God's household, what that means is that he gets to decide how the house operates. He gets to decide the way in which we interact with each other and with the world. And the first thing I want to point out to you, so there's this idea that what does is, what is the community look like? It looks like family. But the next few are going to show you how that family operates and within the values that God has decided that should exist within that family. And the very first one, it should be one of the first ones that comes to your mind, and that is a word that we all know. Biblically speaking, it's pretty central. As a church and who we are in our name, it's pretty central. Love. Love. The Old Testament says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, right? This is in Deuteronomy. We read it. It's a command from God. He made this commandment, right? Why did he make the commandment? Because he was establishing a people. And he said, this is the way that I want my people to function. This is a value that I want to be central for my people. And he had given all the Ten Commandments, but he said the greatest commandment is that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, let me ask you, how many of you tried to do that? How many of you have ever tried to do that? Just raise your hand. If you've ever tried to love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind and strength, I'm raising my hand. I have tried to do that. Now, how many of you also have fallen short in doing that? (laughs) Yeah. And then all of a sudden, Jesus comes along. And he doesn't come along to do away with the law and say that shouldn't, that shouldn't be there. He comes to fulfill it. But then in John 13, Jesus says something shocking. He says, a new commandment I give to you. That you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. Now, what makes this new? 
Because the old commandment was to love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That seems like a lot of doing in us, like us doing that. And Jesus comes along, he says, no, I got something new. No, now I'm actually calling you to love each other the way I loved you. And that's something different. And if we just stop right there and think about that, when was the last time if I pictured Jesus Christ giving himself up? He says, you do not take the life of the Son of Man. You do not take my life. I give it. When you picture Jesus giving himself up to torture, to a whip made of glass and bone, to nails in his hands and feet, to blood coming out of his body, to, as Isaiah says, being beaten so badly that he was not even recognizable. And here's the part. Here, here, here's the thing. This is even the worst of it. But the worst of it is that he was severed from his father and cut off from a relationship that he had never known separation from. And he does this. Why? For the joy that was set before him. And what is that joy? It is you. It is me. And Jesus is saying, we should love each other like that. Not your husband. Not your wife. Not your kids. The church. The people. The people of God. We are to love each other like Jesus loved the church. A new commandment I give to you. Love one another just as I have loved you. And here's the part that we need to really take seriously. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. And so what Jesus is saying is that they're not going to know you're a Christian because you go to church on Sunday. They're not going to know you're a Christian because you have a cross on your neck. They're not going to know you're a Christian because you have a bunch of scriptures memorized. They're going to know you're a Christian because of how you love other Christians. And what, what we have to look at here is, have we been part of communities that aren't the church, that we actually experienced equal amounts of love in? Have you been on a sports team? Or have you, have you, have you gone to a certain restaurant all the time? Or have you been part of some kind of club or organization or a job or, or, or a, a, maybe a place that, of work that you were a part of? And, and it was so familial. It, there, was a, there was a family dynamic to it and a connection to it. And, and actually, maybe it was pretty equal to the church. And what the Bible is saying is it shouldn't be that way. That the love that exists within the church should be so supernatural that actually people are saying like, wow, you guys must be those like followers of Jesus. This is different. And what's sad is that sometimes it's not even equal in the church to these other things, but sometimes it's less. And we're people that need community, that need relationship. We were made for it. It's our design. And so what do we do is we associate with a community where we feel connection and love and oneness. And we feel that because we need that. Unfortunately, sometimes the church is such a poor example of that. The church, the capital C church. When actually Jesus is saying, it's your love for each other that's going to cause them to believe that you're my disciples. Love. What does the community look like? Family. A family that loves. What does the community look like? Unity. John 17, 20 to 23 says, I do not ask for these. No, let me pause. This is Jesus praying you that they also may be in us. And then a little bit further, he says the same thing. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may... Become perfectly one. 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 Unity is not uniformity. Unity is oneness. My kids just went up to my wife the other day and they asked her something. Or I'm sorry, it was the reverse. I, was, I wasn't home. I got home. They asked me something. I was like, yeah, sure, you can do that. And then what I found out was they had already asked my wife. And she said, no. Now, I wasn't home, so I didn't know that, right? 
So my wife finds out. Well, she's like, why are they doing that? I was like, oh, they, yeah, they asked, you know. I said, yeah, sure. She was like, I already told them they couldn't. Uh-oh. <laughs> now they got a problem with mom and... Uh-oh. <laughs> now they got a problem with mom and dad. Because we've laid out something in our home. We teach our kids, mom and dad, this is how we say it. This is how we say it. I don't know if it's, well, by the spirit of God, it's true. Mom and dad always agree. <laughs> That's what we say. <laughs> I just think, I don't know if it's actually true. But what we mean is, when it comes to the decision making for our home, when it comes to the things that they bring us and ask us, we will be in agreement on it. They cannot get an answer from mom and then come over to dad and get a different answer because they're trying to play that game and get what they want from one of us. This is a, kids are smart, man. And this is, this is when the Bible speaks of oneness. It's actually the same root word as holiness. Oneness. Holiness. It's, it's that there is not a divide. James says that we are like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind, that there is a divide in us. And he talks about being double-minded, right? It's, it's, it, it's that there is not oneness there. Jesus is saying that our oneness is something worth praying for. He knew it would be worth praying for. Is it still worth praying for today based on what you see? Jesus prayed for this, but why did he pray for it? And that's a really important thing to look at. That they would be one. Look, again, what is he putting it up against? Not like just void of dispute. He's saying the way that Jesus is one with the Father is the way that we should be one with each other. And why? Why is he praying for this? He says, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Now, we go back to love. Our love for each other is what makes people that are outsiders understand who we are as Christ followers. Oh, okay, you're Christians. Why do they know that? Because of the way we love each other. Now, our unity is what is going to convince the world that Jesus is the Son of God. And this is important to know because this now goes beyond what we experience in our own community. This means that the community that we have and the way that we exist interpersonally, interrelationally, it actually is going to be the determination of whether or not outsiders believe in Jesus. Will they believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Well, why would they believe? Because of our unity. Now, if that's true, can we take the opposite statement and just let that bear some weight on our soul? If we are not in unity as the church of Jesus Christ, then the world will not believe that Jesus exists. That's what Jesus said. And he didn't just say it, he prayed it. And he didn't just pray it once, he prayed it twice. A little down further in that same prayer, I and them, you and me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. What does this community look like that God had in mind? The people that he called to be his chosen people. Family that loves, that is in unity. And lastly, that makes sacrifices for one another. And, and actually, I, I think all of the values that I see Jesus lay out for his people and his community are found within these two texts that I'm going to read next. And they've always blown my mind. Look at this. See, sometimes we can talk about something as like an ideology. It's a thought. It's an idea. But what I want to actually see it functioning. And this is where we see these values functioning. Look at this. In the early church, the first followers of Jesus, Acts 2 verse 42 and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Say amen. 
Acts 4, 32 to 35 gives another picture of what it, this looks like. Love, unity, sacrifice. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace came, was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Wow. Now, I can tell you I have read passages like this and found myself, I remember, I'll never forget it, years back, I preached on one of these texts, and I got to the end, and I was completely distraught. I was just like, God, this is what you have in mind. This is what you planned for us. This is what you had for us. God, I don't know if we're living this. I don't know if this is happening. And it kind of gets us to this point where we ask the question, man, if we're going to be the family of God like this, with this kind of love and unity and sacrifice like this, how is this possible? How is this possible? I really, I asked the question earlier. I'm going to answer it from my own perspective. I don't think Jesus would pray for something that isn't possible. But how? How can we be this people? How can we live this out? I think... There was another person in a similar situation that might be able to help us. His name was Abraham. Remember the guy I told you about where the, the whole promise that God made began? And God was saying, I promise that you will be a father to many nations. And he was without child. He couldn't have kids. His wife couldn't have kids. She was barren. It wasn't possible for them. They were very old. They were well past the age of having kids. And he found himself in a similar situation that we are right now in this moment. How? How is this possible? God, I don't think, I don't know that I, I can see a way for you to accomplish this. And so God tells Abraham, he says, go out and look at the stars and count them. And I, I imagine Abraham out there just trying to, I wonder at what point he stopped. I was like, okay, God, I get it. God was like, yeah, that's how many descendants. I'm going to get a promise that didn't seem possible, just like what we talked about this one, love and unity and sacrifice and what we read about in Acts 2 and Acts 4, a promise that just seems like it's impossible. How is it possible? How does God show Abraham that it is possible and that the promise he's making with him is possible? possible and he tells Abraham to do something he says I want you to go get some animals I want you to take them I want you to cut them in half and lay them in two lines with an aisle down the middle now for some of us this is happening in Genesis 15 for some of us we're just like what why would God ask him to do this but at this time and in this culture Abraham knew what was happening this was called a ceremony of covenant and the ceremony of covenant was that when a servant or someone that was of a lower status was making a covenant to a lord, to a master that was over them, they would do this. They would, they would cut the animal, they would lay the parts down, and then what they would do is they would pass through the middle, the center, the aisle that was created from the parts of the animal. And what was that passing through? What did that mean? That meant that they were making a covenant with their lord. And what, what were they saying? They were saying, if I break this covenant, then may I be torn in two just like this animal. If I break this covenant, then may I be torn in two. And so Abraham knew what God was asking of him. And he's laying out the parts of the animal and he creates the aisle and he's just waiting to pass through. But then all of a sudden, at that moment, when it had all been prepared for the ceremony of covenant, the Bible says in Genesis 15 that it got very dark and that a pillar of fire passed through the center. 
And what was that? That was God. And why is that so shocking? Because the, the master, the Lord, they never passed through. It was always the one making the covenant to their Lord that passed through. And what was God saying in this moment? God was saying, if I don't fulfill this promise to you, then you can tear me in two. I am so committed to this promise of what I am saying that I will establish in you and through you, Abraham, for my people. That not only if I break the promise, will I pass through. Because notice Abraham never had to pass through. But even if you break the promise, I will pass through. And this is what we see Jesus being willing to do when he says, look, they keep breaking my covenant. They keep failing to meet the demands of my law. They keep falling short. And I know they can never do it with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, with all their strength. So I will pass through. You see, the first thing we need to understand when it comes to how this is possible is that we need to understand that the only way it's possible is through a covenant. And that covenant was not initiated by you or by me. God, I promise I'll do better. God, I promise I'll I'll give it my all this time. I know I messed it up, but I'll do better. You know who initiated the covenant? God himself. And he said, even if you can't keep it, I am so committed to this covenant to make you my people in love, unity, and sacrifice that I'll pass through, that I'll be torn in half for you to have what I am giving you. How the community is possible, it's only possible through covenant. And that covenant is a covenant that Jesus has made with you and with me. How is this possible? Conviction. Conviction that is personal. You see, the temptation that we can have in a message like this is we can say, yeah, that's what's wrong with the church. Yeah, that's what's wrong with that leader. Yeah, that's what's wrong with that pastor. Yeah, that's what's wrong with that brother. Yeah, that's what's wrong with that Christian. Yeah, that's what's wrong. Because we hear this and we say, that's what it's supposed to be and it didn't happen to me and you didn't treat me this way and you didn't act this way and you didn't speak this way and that's what we do is we actually use this as ammunition. But Jesus is saying, I never gave this to you to be ammunition. I gave this to you to look at your own heart. And the conviction has to be personal. When we see God passing through the animals that had been broken to say, I will keep this covenant. When we see Jesus hanging on that cross for sins that he did not commit, saying, I will keep this covenant. There has to be something inside of us, a conviction that rises in us that says, Jesus, work in me. Produce love in me. Let me love because Jesus is the only way they'll know that we are believers. Jesus, let me be in unity with my brothers and sisters in Christ and my leadership and the people that you've placed me under, God, because this is the only way that the world will believe that you are the Son of God. That conviction has to be personal. It has to live in me for me, not for others, not for me to go, see, I told you so. But for me to look at this word and go, God, please forgive me. Help me work this in me. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, but also of righteousness. We don't often talk about that. We only think about conviction in regards to sin. But did you know that the Holy Spirit convicts you in regards to righteousness? That he produces a conviction within you. Not condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. No, no, no. A conviction within you that says, yes, I want this.
this, Jesus? How is this possible? Covenant. How is this possible? Conviction. My last thought for you. How is this possible? Connection. Jesus says in John 15 that he is the vine and we are the branches. And that any branch that is apart from him, what happens to a branch that's disconnected from a vine? It dies. But if you stay connected to me, you will bear fruit. And Galatians 5.22 tells us what that fruit is. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That the fruit that we need as the church of Jesus Christ is a matter of abiding. It's a matter of connection. It's a matter of saying, I must reconnect to Jesus because I don't have peace in my heart. If I'll connect with him, I know the peace will come. I got to connect to Jesus because the love is not there. It's not flowing. But if I connect to Jesus, it will come. I got to connect to Jesus because I have no joy. My joy is gone. I just feel depression. I feel weight. I feel heaviness. But if I connect to Jesus, then the joy of the Lord will be my strength. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning. And I'm here today to declare to you that you are made to live in community. It's your design. It's God's design for you. Your desire to be known and to know others, it's not a bad thing. It's in you because you were made in the image of God. And God is saying that we are to be his people. And he did whatever it took to make it possible to be a people that, that operate in love, unity, and sacrifice. But it begins with his covenant. It begins with Jesus as the initiator of the covenant. It's the one who is willing to go to the cross. And if you're here today and you desire to be part of a family like that, the Bible says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Salvation is available to you today to be delivered and set free from the oppression and the weight that only God can liberate you from and to bring you in, to graft you in to the family of God that you would too, like many in this room, be able to say, Abba, Father, cry out to God as sons and daughters of a good Father that loves you, that will never disappoint you, that will never leave you, that will never forsake you. If you desire to be part of his family today, you desire to give your life to him, this is the first invitation. I just want to ask you to lift up your hand right now. I want to pray with you for a moment. If you desire to give your life, thank you. I see that hand. Thank you. I see that hand. Anybody else? You desire to give your life to Jesus. You want to be part of his family. Yeah, I see that hand in the back. I see that hand. Thank you. Anybody else? You desire to be part of God's family. Anyone that was raising their hand, come on, church, let's help them pray right now. Come on, just repeat these words. Say, Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me for dying the death that I should have died for my sin so that I could be part of your family so that I could be forgiven so that I could be given a new name thank you that I can be your sons and daughters thank you that I can be your child I thank you that you can make me whole and new I give you my life I want to live for you from this day forward in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Come on, can we celebrate with all those? Yes. Yes. Okay, next invitation is for the people of God. For those of you that just prayed that prayer, the Bible says that your salvation is not simply a prayer. It is a life. I want to encourage you to meet with one of our prayer team members in the back before you leave so that they can put something in your hands because we want to walk alongside you in that life that God's called you to live for Jesus. You can't do it alone. Come on, tell your neighbor right now, you can't do it alone, right? We have to be in this together. And if you 
want to make a statement to the Lord, not to a man, but to God himself and say, God, yes, I desire to be part of a community of love and unity and sacrifice. And God, I will do my part to live that out within this community of believers. If that's your heart, I want you to stand up to your feet right now. And I want you, as you're standing, to just lift up both hands to Jesus and just give him praise that he's made it possible. Come on, give him praise that it's only by him. It's only by his work. It's only by his work. It's only by his work. It's not by might. It's not by power, but it's by his spirit. It's by his spirit. It's by his spirit. Come on, thank Jesus that he was willing to walk through and actually take the curse for you, to take the cup for you so that you could take the cup of of communion with him so that you could be brought in. Oh God, we give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you thanks in this place, God. We lift our hands. We lift our voice. We lift our praise to you, God. Come on, lift your voices with me church come on we're standing to make a declaration to our God and we give you thanks today Lord that you have called us to be part of a community of believers that love sacrificially that walk and operate in unity Lord that are committed Jesus to live this out God and I praise you Jesus that you will allow us Lord to love our brothers and sisters God to stand in unity Lord your word says that Lord if we sow discord among among our brothers and sisters in Christ this is an abomination to you God Lord we take it seriously Lord your word says that God if we walk in unity that the world will believe that you are the son of God Lord I thank you for the commitment that we can make today to say Lord God we are committed to be a body of believers that are unified we're not uniform God we are unified we are connected God with one spirit with one mind with one heart And God, I pray that that spirit would rise up within every man, within every woman in this room today, within those that are gathered with us online today, God, who are part of our online family. I pray, Jesus, may we join together as one. May we be committed to love. May we be committed to unity. May we be committed to sacrifice in the strong name of Jesus. Come on, give him praise. Come on, give him praise.